Hi, Maddie. How did you sleep last night? Hi, Shin. I was not expecting this question, but I slept well, and I think my brain is feeling fresh and recharged. That's good. Did you know that the CSF is responsible for a lot of very important functions, including washing up your brain? I think I should know this, but I would love to hear more about the CSF and why it's important. Well, luckily for us, we have Dr. Madeline Lancaster today, a group leader at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, UK, talking about why the cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, is important and how we can study this vital brain fluid and its special features and function in vitro. My name is Shen Neng. And I'm Mehdi Jurfi, and you are listening to a new episode of Science Rehashed. Welcome back. Hi everyone, welcome back to Science Rehash. Just wanted to let you know that we started an account on Patreon. We are a team of volunteers doing this podcast. So if you want to support us and help us continue producing these podcasts, log on to our website, sciencerehash.com, and go on to the support us page and become a Patreon. And with that, we are going to introduce Dr. Lancaster. Dr. Lancaster, welcome to Science Rehashed. We are going to have a discussion regarding the CSF, which is apparently important brain fluid that we don't know much about. Thank you very much, Dr. Lancaster, for joining us today. I would like you to start with introducing yourself. I'm Madeline Lancaster. I'm a group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, UK. So I am a developmental biologist. I did my PhD at UC San Diego with Joe Gleason working on mouse cerebellar development, actually. And then I moved to Vienna to do my postdoc with Jürgen Knoblich, looking at developmental aspects of you know neural stem cell fate decisions. And my time there is, is where I also developed the cerebral organoid protocols that we use in my own lab now. So I've been running my lab for five years now, and we are interested primarily in human brain size determination from an evolutionary perspective, but also from a neurological disease perspective. So I have done some research on my own about the CSF, and we know that the CSF is generated by specific structures in the brain called choroid plexus. I know you dedicated a lot of your research effort on this topic. So can you tell us more about these structures and why we should pay attention to them? The choroid plexus is this really highly folded sort of fluffy stuff on the inside of the ventricles of the brain. And it's what actually generates the cerebral spinal fluid because it's really heavily understudied. It doesn't get all the, the flash that, you know, neurons get. Because, we you know, when you think of the brain, everybody just focuses on neurons. That's what's doing all the, you know, computational work. And, of course, that's true. But, you know, those, those cells can't do what they need to do without having a lot of really important support players. And there's been increasing interest in supportive cells like glia. But the choroid plexus is still sort of just left behind. It looks like a boring secretory epithelium. People just aren't, haven't been interested in it. But I think I'm hoping that that our work, and, and I think there's a lot of increasing work in this field, is showing that this is really an important tissue and we really need to understand more about it. And considering that the CSF is, it's almost, some people think it's similar to like the lymph system of the rest of the body, you know, it's, it's as important as the blood. And we know very little about it. The choroid plexus, not only does it produce CSF, but it actually also absorbs things back out of the CSF. And so if CSF is flowing around the brain and kind of helping clear out things like amyloid beta that normally is forming these plaques, then, you know, that's getting out into the CSF and is the choroid plexus involved in sort of uptake of that. And I think it's not a coincidence that, for example, the brain region that has the highest levels of APOE, which is this important Alzheimer's biomarker and, and susceptibility gene, the highest levels of that are in the choroid plexus. And so I think there's a lot of really interesting questions around how it might be involved in, in uptake and, and clearance. This is absolutely fascinating. And the choroid plexus, besides secreting CSF as a second T-roll in the brain, it works as a barrier that prevents free entry of toxic molecules or drugs from the blood. 
This barrier is referred to as the blood CSF barrier and serves to regulate the environment of the brain. Can you explain the importance of the blood CSF barrier in the brain also in relation to the brain development? This barrier function is, is highly tied to its function in producing CSF because it does need to only allow certain things into the CSF so that it can control the makeup of CSF. You know, the, the CSF has free access to the brain. And there's also increasing studies showing that, for example, during sleep, CSF really kind of leaks into the brain and kind of washes out the brain, seems to wash out, you know, toxic byproducts and things like that. So anything that would get into the CSF from the blood would also have free access to the brain. So this barrier, this blood CSF barrier is just as important as the blood brain barrier, which is the barrier surrounding the blood vessels in the brain. And so this barrier is already present during development. It's, it's actually a, a common misconception that the blood brain barrier and the blood CSF barrier isn't actually established until after birth, but that's not, that's just simply not true. There's actually already a blood CNS barrier present during development. And then we think probably certain components that are in the CSF, either made by the choroid plexus and probably also transported across from the blood could, could then influence brain development but also later in adulthood, brain homeostasis. What are the main challenges in studying the CP in humans that push you to study the CSF and choroid plexus in vitro? You know, its location is very difficult to get at. It's at the very center of our brains. It's very hard to access. You know, you cannot get go in and like take a biopsy or something without damaging surrounding brain tissue. So this is one of the key challenging parts. Yeah, it's one of the key challenges. But also, I mean, just like the rest of the brain, you know, we can only really look at it after the fact. We can't really look at what's going on before a disease onset that might be important for the actual cause of a disease. We can't look at it, you know, during the disease as it's, you know, escalating. We can only really look at it at the end point. And that doesn't necessarily tell you what was causing that disease. So having an in vitro model like this will enable us to look at all different stages of, of different conditions that affect this tissue. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. I definitely want to know more about this. So I know that in order to study the CSF, you developed one of the most advanced type of human organoids that science has to offer. What are brain organoids? It sort of says it in the name. So organoid, oid means like, so like, like an organ. And so they are like a brain, essentially. And so what they really are are pretty small brain-like tissues. So they're, they're essentially little pieces of brain tissue that self-organize and form according to the same kinds of intrinsic developmental programs that are at play during brain development in an embryo. And can you explain why do we need an in vitro model or in general, why do we need an organoid model? I think particularly for the brain, we really do need an in vitro human model, and human is the key. The brain is one of the most unique features or the most uh, unique organ in our body compared with other animals. So obviously those models, those animal models, are lacking in many important respects. And you can see that when it comes to drug treatments for neurological and mental health conditions. I mean, we're still treating a lot of mental health conditions with drugs that are decades old because we just can't find any new drugs with the existing models. We need better models. Recently in July, you also published an incredible paper showing organoids that also produce cerebral spinal fluid. Would you tell us a little bit about what motivated this project to begin with and some of the basic results? Yeah, so this was work led by a very talented postdoc in my lab, Laura Pellegrini. When she started in the lab, she, you know, she started making her own brain organoids and started noticing that occasionally, not very often, but occasionally we would get some organoids that would form these funny sort of like fluid filled sacs coming off of them. So seeing these fluid filled sacs on our brain organoids and knowing that brain organoids can spontaneously make this CSF producing tissue, we thought maybe that fluid is actually something similar to CSF. And we were able to, you know, extract the fluid and analyze it and find that it indeed was very similar to CSF. 
And in the model that you and the postdoc you mentioned generated, how similar is it to you know human CS? You you mentioned that there's a lot of different qualities that are similar, but you know is it about seventy percent recapitulating the human CSF, or is it only thirty percent? Actually, if I didn't tell you which sample was which, you wouldn't be able to tell. I can tell you that right now. There are differences, but they're the same kind of differences you might even see between different uh, CSF samples from different patients, for example. Mm -hmm. So proteomically, it's highly similar. The only way you can tell is when you start to look for some of the things that are um, in our media that the, the organoids are growing in that, of course, a human brain wouldn't be exposed to. So obviously, we're not growing our organoids in human blood. You know, they're growing in a media that contains things like serum proteins from cows. So obviously, we see cow serum proteins in there. And then obviously that's, that's not present in human, but human CSF would have the same proteins. They'd just be human. So we're actually seeing the same sort of like transport of certain blood components into the CSF, other things not going in the CSF as, as they shouldn't. And then a lot of things being made by the choroid plexus and pumped into the CSF. And these are, these are all the same things that you see in the actual CSF. One of the things that came out as very different um, in terms of quantitation is these dark and light cells that you, you know, talk about in the, in the paper. I was wondering if you could explain what those are, what are the differences, and mm -hmm. why you were looking at those. Well, one of the things that we then wanted to do after we established this approach was then to try to learn something from it, use it now to learn something about the choroid plexus that maybe we didn't know before. Because, yeah, because now we have this in vitro tool and we have access suddenly. And so what we did was we did a lot of single cell transcriptomics where we actually look at the expression profile of individual cells in the choroid plexus. We, well, Laura had the idea of comparing essentially the proteomic data that we got from the CSF. So what are the proteins being secreted to the expression profile of the cells and try to identify what cells are making the stuff that ends up in the CSF, right? And what we found is actually that all cells are not the same. There are some cells that make certain components of the CSF and other cells that make other components. And when we looked more carefully, what we found is actually that there are at least four subtypes of secretory cells in, in these organoids. And previously, you know, the choroid plexus was just thought of as essentially basically two main cell types, the secretory epithelium being just, you know, one homogeneous cell type, and then, you know, the support mesenchymal cells underneath. And so what we're finding is that the epithelium is actually much more complicated than, or much more complex than, than people thought before. And so we find these, these dark cells and these light cells. And the reason they're called that is actually because back in the 70s, there were EM studies on choroid plexus that showed that on EM, there were these dark and light cells, but there's nothing other than that known. Why are they dark? Why are these light? nothing other than that known. And our transcriptomics studies show that there was a cell population that had a lot of mitochondria and another cell population that had fewer mitochondria and had more cilia. And in fact, in some of these old studies in kidney, actually, where they've also described dark and light cells, they think they're dark when they have more mitochondria and light when they have more cilia. And that's exactly what we see in our, in our transcriptomics. So we're actually able now to provide a molecular understanding of these populations that were sort of just mm. observed in old EM studies, but nothing more known about them. Other than the, the features that you see that's different between these cells, what, what does it mean for the functional difference? So we were able to assign CSF components to those subtypes of cells. And so we were able to show that certain components in the, in, in the CSF, for example, apolipoproteins or some of the biomarkers for, for human neurodegenerative disease, that they're being secreted by those specific subtypes of cells. What that means in terms of like, why is that important? We actually still don't know because we're still even just learning about what is in the CSF and why is it being produced? I mean, why are there all these apolipoproteins being produced and pumped into the CSF? We don't even know. And how do you validate the organoid models? How reliable are they for neodrugs? So there were, I'd say, three major characterizations that we did on these organoids. And for each one, we also compared to in vivo data. 
So the first major characterization was this transcriptomics, where we're looking at the cell types in there and what they're expressing. And then we took our single cell transcriptomics and compared it with published transcriptomics from in vivo data sets. And we compared from both human, now the only human data set available is from developing human brain. And then we also compared with developing mouse, where there's actually a, an atlas of the entire mouse embryo. And within that, there are choroid plexus cells. So we were able to compare with human developing choroid plexus and mouse developing choroid plexus, and then look at our choroid plexus organoids at a similarly sort of developmental stage. And what we found is actually, first of all, that they were highly similar, but particularly similar to the human. So more similar to the human data set than to the mouse. And that we are making these from human cells. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable sense. that we can see that, you know, that we can see that species specificity. The second major characterization we did was of the CSF-like fluid inside. So we did the proteomic analysis of that. And then we also compared with samples that we ourselves analyzed, but also existing data sets from human fetal, human pediatric, and human adult CSF, and looked at how it compares. And what we found is that our CSF-like fluid seems to change over time, and that very, very old organoids actually look more similar to human pediatric and adult CSF samples. So we're even seeing this kind of maturation going on. And finally, looking at the barrier, we looked at a number of drugs where the brain permeability is actually known. And we applied those drugs to the media, so the media being sort of like the blood compartment, and looked and saw how much of that drug actually crosses into the inside, into the CSF-like fluid. And we compared that with measurements that have been done in humans from blood serum or plasma values and CSF values and actually found a perfect correlation. So not just a correlation, but actually a quantitative predictability of our organoids, actually. Interesting. It sounds like these organoids have been grown for half a year or mm -hmm. more now. So how do you see the translation of this particular system in terms of drug screening, um, even testing of a number of things? Like if it takes so long to grow them, is there a better way to do this? Is there a better way to maybe advance these organoids to the pediatric stage? Have you guys mm -hmm. thought about that at all? Yeah, we haven't thought about ways of speeding them up. I have to say that even our drug measurements were actually done not on such old organoids. So they were usually, I think, around 55, 60 days old, which is still, you know, a couple of months, but it's it's reasonable. I mean, you yeah. can actually plan ahead like that. And I guess this has been a question that came to my mind as well until I did, you know, some more digging in the literature, because I was like, how in the world can they be modeling this barrier? when this barrier, you know, must not be present until much later, or at least not mature enough. But like I say, I think it's actually a really common misconception that the barrier is not present during development, but it, it is, it is already there during development. And I think it's already highly selective, even during development, you know, it may be okay, actually, to look at drug permeability on something that is still sort of developmental. I think probably we'd want to mature them more for some of the other types of studies that I think would be really interesting to do with these, looking at things like neurodegeneration and clearance of aggregates and things like that. So I do, I think there it would be good to try to come up with ways of maturing them. Just a final thing on that, I, I think it's, it's also could be possible to come up with new approaches to try to preserve them so that you wouldn't have to make them new every time. You could, mm. you could just go back to old ones that you've got preserved. This is like incredible study and there is no doubt about this, but also we would like to touch base on the limitations of any study. What about the reproducibilities of the organoid models in general? If you can comment on that, because there was a paper, I think one year or two years before published in Nature, actually from one of the researchers in Boston, that shows there is a significant heterogeneity going on with, with different organoids cultured in the lab from batch to batch. When it comes to this particular study, the reproducibility of getting choroid plexus from you know, a brain organoid, it, this is probably the most reproducible method I've ever actually <laughs> worked on. It's very reproducible. It does, however, require that you already start with organoids that are neural. But as long as they are neural, they will make choroid plexus using this protocol at least nine times out of 10, probably 10 times out of 10. So it's very reproducible in that respect. But there's a bigger thing here. And I think that's what you're getting at, Mindy, which is this 
reproducibility of, of brain organoids more broadly. And I think there's this common misconception that brain organoids are more irreproducible, I guess, than 2D cultures. But I actually don't think that that is the case. And I think there's there's even a study recently that just came out from Rick Libsey talking about reproducibility in 2D cultures. And it's pretty well known in the stem cell field that there are certain cell lines that people like, other cell lines that they don't like to work with, you know. And so some cell lines seem to be already biased, probably epigenetically, towards specific germ layers. What we find is that if they are already biased towards a neural germ layer, then it's quite nice. They're very reproducible. We can get brain organoids really nicely. The problem is when you start to work with cell lines that don't already have that bias. So the ideal for us, at least, would be a protocol where you can have that fully self-organized, completely intrinsic developmental program with all the beautiful tissue architecture that we just love reliably. And we don't have that yet. We have it with some cell lines, but we don't have it universally. And that is definitely something we need to work on. What are the limitations of the lack of these other structures for these models? You know, no wonder actually that brain organoids can form with such a limited amount of exogenous, you know, bioengineering and stuff. Because actually, I mean, a lot of people don't realize, but the brain isn't actually vascularized until about the beginning of the second trimester. There's actually no vascularization. It's just relying on nutrient diffusion from the surface and from the inside, from the ventricles and the inside. So I think that's why we're able to make brain organoids without any vasculature. But obviously then what happens is you you see them matching very nicely the tissue architecture, the expression profile, you know, a lot of different features up until about, you know, mid gestation and then things start to break down. They don't quite look like it anymore. There's a lot of things that, that look different, obviously. And I think it's it, that's because then obviously normally in vivo, those tissues would be getting vascularization. They'd be getting other cell types too, microglia. I think even just like things people don't even necessarily consider like the blood flow and the forces that that generates, you know, even things like that, that these organoids aren't getting. And that's going to be really difficult, I think, to address because it's not just a matter of like chunking in a bunch of endothelial cells. You've got to get all the other support cells, the parasites that actually, you know, are surrounding that. You've got to get something that looks like actual blood, but doesn't, you know, coagulate in the dish. And then you've got to get something to pump it through. And it can't just go through smoothly because that's not how blood moves. It's got to look like it's being pumped like, you know, a heart. There's a lot of bioengineering hurdles that we have to overcome to get there. One one quick follow up with that. I love our, our discussion where it's heading. <laughs> Can we summarize in this way? Are the organoid models the perfect as of today in vitro models for developmental studies? Because you have this orchestras of the cells, the architectures that you need for developmental studies. But if you go to the other directions like neurodegeneration or neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer, you want to mature them and push them all the way to get the, the plaques and the tangles. That might not be the right model for those studies. What is your take on this? Definitely think that like so many things, it's, it's important to consider the question first and then apply the appropriate method. So that applies to, should I even use brain organoids, but also like what brain organoid protocol should I use? And so, you know, when you're talking about a neurodegenerative condition, you probably don't necessarily need all the tissue architecture that organoids give you. I think, I think you can probably look at trying to, to generate plaques and tangles, maybe even, you know, even in a 2D system, I think, but I know that there's been issues there that they haven't actually been able to get both the plaques and tangles. But even like a a simple 3D context that doesn't necessarily have the architecture, but looks maybe more like a neurosphere. I I think that that's perfectly fine. And and the, the point is, you know, what is the question? Is the question, how are the neurons dying? How are the plaques and tangles forming? You know, how are the cells dealing with these aggregates? And you don't necessarily need, you know, all of the complexity that an organoid gives you for that. But again, it depends on the question. And so maybe for some things you would want to have that, and then you'd want to be able to generate organoids with the right tissue architecture that you can mature. And we're not there yet, so... I think Mehdi and I like to kind of touch upon some of the ethical <laughs> questions as yeah. well, especially when it comes to kind of sci-fi 
uh, science, like making mini brains in a dish, essentially. What are kind of some of the ethical concerns? Are you currently worried about it with the stage of science we're at? Or is it coming up in you know, the up- upcoming couple of years or is it very much in the future? I think it's a, a really great question. Also, just from a philosophical perspective, I mean, I I took a philosophy class in college and, you know, there's some really cool stuff there that, that, you know, that, that I think gets philosophers also pretty excited about. I think realistically, being a neurobiologist myself, having read the literature on, on developmental neurobiology and kind of what is necessary to end up with a brain that's potentially capable of conscious thought and the kinds of things that we obviously don't want in a, in a dish. I still think we're really far away from that, but I, it's never too early to think about these questions. So I think it's good that we're thinking about them way in advance. And I think it, I think it's good if we probably set some, some ground rules already and say, look, if we reach this point, then we've crossed the line. So just don't, you know, don't cross this line. And so I think we're, you know, as a community, we're working together to try to come up with some of those kinds of guidelines. But I do think that that line is probably pretty far away. So I, I would say we don't have anything to worry about in the near future. Then you also have to think about, you know, what are we, what are we sort of worried about here? Are we worried if we're worried about sort of human level cognition, then we have to think about, well, what is it? What does a human brain have? And a human brain is really big. So it's got 80 to hundred billion neurons. And these organoids have around the number of neurons that a cockroach brain has. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we're still pretty far away from. This is great. It is reassuring to know we don't have to worry about conscious mini brains quite yet. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster, for this extremely interesting discussion. We learned a lot about the CSF and also organoids. Yes, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Lancaster. If you liked learning about the CSF and if you want to learn more about scientific breakthroughs, remember you can support us by going to our website. We need you to keep talking about science for everyone, to everyone. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. Thank you to Dr. Rudy Tenzi for providing us with the music for our intro. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also visit our website at sciencerehashed.com. We would also like to thank all the members of Science Rehashed who contributed their time in making Science Rehashed possible, including our writers and producers, Madura Lolikar, Kira Brenner, Shuang Zhang, and Chiara Maffei. We would also like to thank our marketing director, Carla Diavanzo, our business development director, Li Chi Lo, our sound editors, Sophia Nastri, Tavi Pollard, and Jared Warsaw, our assistant, Rebecca Solson, and our creative director, Emma Brand. <laughs>